a later time. So thank you so much for joining Gaul um, and our five ways to succeed in your summer experience or as a new attorney. We have some great women on the panel today, um, <laughs> including Sandra Jean, um, who is currently the Senior Vice President of HR Operations with Diversicare Healthcare Services um, and has a long career in HR operations and labor and employment. Um, she has also been a trial attorney for the National Labor uh, Relations Board and served as a law clerk um, to criminal and civil judges. And she is a um, board member for Gall. I've worked closely with her and um, cannot wait to hear about her experience and the knowledge that she has to share. Um, our other two panelists are Ola Yeni Odomoso, <laughs> uh, a 3L. I hope I got that right. Odomosu. Su, su, su. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, welcome and thank you for um, putting this together. Um, this is uh, important information as we uh, you know, are about to head into summer internships and uh, as new attorneys start their uh, first, uh, first jobs. Um, yeah. And um, Ms. Odomosu is a 3L at Emory Law School. Um, and currently a, a law clerk at Barnes and Thornburg, where I believe that you'll be an associate, is that right? Yes, um, in the intellectual property department. Yes. Um, very exciting. And um, you were previously an, administ uh, an intern for an administrative ju judge at, in the uh, EEOC. Yes. Um, and you've also spent your last summer uh, as an intern at Barnes and Thornburg. Mm -hmm. Was that also in the intellectual property department? Yeah, it was sort of as a general um, associate, right? But I definitely found my way. Um, I gravitated towards intellectual property and just sort of stuck there. So you could say, you know, that I was in the IP department for sure. Okay. And last but definitely not least, we have a fellow Emory Law uh, 3L, Cadell, uh, Cadell Lubin. Yes. Um, yeah. And she has and some interesting um, background. We were just talking about how uh, she did the Google Legal Scholars Program last summer and um, also spent uh, a portion of her summer working at the Atlanta office of the Jackson Lewis uh, firm and with Google. Um, and currently, I believe that you're a legal extern at Coca-Cola and you'll be continuing that um, after graduation. Um, and that's very exciting. Um, as well, and you're from Florida, as am I. So great to have um, another uh, another person from the Sunshine State joining us here. So thank you so much, um, ladies, uh, for being on this panel, uh, for putting this together, um, and I cannot wait to hear what you have to share. Thank you. For Me too. I'm really excited to be here. Um, we do have a small audience, but I think. I'm so confident that a lot of what we have to give today is valuable information and I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you. I will take a moment. Oh, I'm sorry, Cadell. I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that Tatanisha Perryman is also on the uh, webinar and she's also a board member. So I'm not sure that she can be with us the whole time, but she's she wanted to come out and support. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm grateful to see everybody here today. Um, and I just wanted to really sort of um, give a brief overview, right, of the topics that we're going to discuss, right? So we want everybody to leave here with at least five practical ways of becoming a great summer associate or even a great new attorney, right? We want to give you guys tools that you can apply towards becoming successful in your legal career. Um, Briefly, you know, as an overview, five of the tips are firstly, be your authentic self. Tip number two is to network to connect. Tip number three is to seek mentorship with purpose. Tip number four is to take ownership of your work product. And the final tip will be to remain confident, right, is to be confident. So, you know, members of the panel, I just wanted to quickly ask, right, when we talk about tip number one, right, be your authentic self. What are some of your thoughts on these things? What are some of the advice that you can give um, to sort of be your authentic self within the workplace? Um, I can start, Yenny. So mm -hmm. I think for me, one 
one thing that keeps me authentic is treating everyone with the same level of respect. So I think whether you're going to be working in a firm or in-house, um, make sure you're treating the receptionist, the secretary, your, your staff, everyone um, with respect and the dignity that they deserve. And even though you're, you'll be a new associate or a new summer associate, and you're reporting to partners or you're reporting to different people in the firm, um, do not let that take away from the fact that you should still treat the people that are helping you and supporting you with care and compassion and respect because eventually um, these are the people that help you day in and day out. So if you're not treating them with respect, they're gonna make your life more difficult than it can be. So yeah. I think it's important that you recognize every level of help that's gonna be at your workplace. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I definitely wanted to say, um, I think there's this idea that you sort of have to leave who you are at home and bring a complete impersonation or a complete fraud of yourself to the workplace. And I'm, I'm an active advocate against that, right? I think your workplace, you can find a passion and sort of tie it. For me, um, diversity is one of the things that I care deeply about, right? I'm really um, into sort of try my best to eliminate inequality and inequity. Um, and so while I was a summer associate, right, I hadn't even received an offer yet, but there was a particular meeting that we had where somebody was introduced as the diversity officer. And I thought, well, this is a way for me to bring my authentic self to the workplace. And I shot her an email and said, hey, I would love to meet up with you and see how we can sort of diversify the summer program. I had not received an offer, okay? I was really just the summer associate, not to um, belittle that title, but I didn't have much leg to stand on, but I still had the, the passion and drive to say, hey, this is something that I'm interested in, and this is sort of a, an avenue that I wanna pursue. And I ended up being invited to the diversity meetings and, and really having a say on certain tweaks and certain ways that we can really input diversity into, summer, into the summer program. So that was just another example of how you can bring your authentic self to work, right? Look for ways, look for organizations that speak to your passion, um, and then sort of everything will sort of fall into place. Ms. Sandra, do you have um, any comments on that? Okay, unmuting myself. Absolutely, I agree with what both of you said. Um, the challenge, um, so I've been an attorney for 24 plus years now, so I'm an old <laughs> no. uh, attorney, but um, one of the things that I see people challenged with in the workplace is exactly what you said. How do you remain your genuine self, but yet able to make a contribution? And I will second what you said. People are looking for uh, people that are genuine because they can relate to that. Um, yeah. as opposed to if you're trying to be something that you're not, then people don't know how to deal with you and yeah. you end up being a lone wolf because what they see is not really what you are. So yeah. support what both of you said is, is to just bring yourself, you're there, you're invited to the firm or the workplace or the association, whatever the environment is, you're brought there because someone saw something in you. And so shine that light, be yourself, speak with that voice and be present in that person so that people can relate to what and who you are. And Naz, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, but I will say this for those of you that are in the uh, room, even if you're not a panelist, please, I'm looking for feedback from you in the chat box. If you have questions, make sure you put those in there, comments. We wanna hear from you as well. But Naz, I don't know if you wanna add anything. Thanks, Sandra, for um, mentioning that, You know, to post any questions in like the chat box, but I definitely agree with you. You know, when you go through the interview process, um, the firm, the company, you know, uh, if you're working for like the government sector uh, for a nonprofit, what have you, um, they have selected you and they selected you for a reason. When they interviewed you and they uh, talked to you and they spoke to you as a person, it was not just what you brought on your resume. You came, you know, they, they hired you for who you are. And that's exactly what they're, what they're looking for is for you to be yourself. Um, and to have that relationship, not only within the office, but then also with the clients. Our industry is, is service-based. Um, you develop a relationship with your clients. 
And, um, you know, I think that there might be a misconception that as, as an intern or as a younger associate, you may not have that face-to-face -face with like the clients, but you definitely will. And, uh, you know, you need to be, and clients, and whether they are professionals, whether they are lay people, um, they will definitely be able to tell whether or not, like Sandra, as you said, if you're being genuine, whether they can trust you and the position that you're in um, when they're coming to you for legal advice and they're coming to your, to your firm and to you specifically, they're looking for someone that they can trust. So if you are not being um, you know, your, yourself, then they will catch on to it and they will not be able to trust you and, um, and allow you to guide them the right way. Yeah, yeah. So the first tip is be your authentic self, right? Bring your authentic self to work. Please disregard what people have probably been telling you throughout law school, right? Um, which is to just not be a, a robotic version of who you truly are. And I think that sort of takes away the color and the authenticity um, of not only the workplace, of, but of what separates um, someone who's great from someone who's good, right? So that's the first step. The second tip is to network to connect. Right. And as we sort of discuss this tip, right, I want people to think of um, who to network with. How do I go about networking with somebody? Right. What is networking? I know for myself, I don't like the word networking. I think it's weird. Um, or the bottom line is we're just building relationships with each other as human beings. That's sort of our nature um, to build relations and to relate to one another. So I don't quite think that we should abide by different rules just because we're in the workplace, right? Um, so when I think of networking, I think of reaching out to people with intention. If I'm going to reach out for, to you, I'm going to have a good reason for it, right? It's because you're in IP or it's because I saw something on your LinkedIn page that I liked, or it's because we work in the same firm, right? And that sort of helps you speak more or it sort of helps with the flow of conversation while you network, right? I think a lot of problem, a lot of problems that come with these networking lunches is that it's awkward. Um, and I always ask my friends, well, why did you reach out to that person? And they say, oh, I don't know. I just thought, I just thought to reach out to them. And I said, well, that's why it's awkward because you didn't even know why you're there. You know, sub subconsciously you sort of made that association that you don't even, you're not familiar with this person, right? So I think that should be a, a thing to remember, right? Network with intention. Um, I can continue off that, Yenny. I think throughout law school, um, we're trained to network. When you go to career services, they tell you, oh, just network and you know, you'll get this or network and you'll meet this person, you'll find a job. And the word comes off um, very empty to me. Like it means nothing when people say network. So when I think of it, um, I never go into a networking conversation or a call without having um, a list or bullet points of things that I want to address on that call because a lot of times you're going to ask people to take time out of their day they're not billing they're not meeting with clients and you never want someone to feel as if you've wasted their time if you ask for a 15 minute lunch keep it or a 15 minute call keep it at 15 minutes if you ask for 30 minutes or an hour make sure you're being concise and you're being respectful of their time that's the first thing once you get there and you're actually having the conversation I feel like it's not the responsibility of the person that you reached out to to make conversation with you. You should know why you're calling them or why you're inviting them to lunch. What do you want to talk about? If it's, you know, the IP practice, then that's what it is. If it's how did they make it through their journey, then that's what it is. But you should have at least three to four points that you want to touch on. So to get past that awkwardness, make sure you're asking thoughtful questions. Now, don't ask something that if you did a quick Google search on their LinkedIn, you would have seen that they're vice president of this or that they practice this. You know, you can elaborate on that, but I think common sense questions or things that would have required a simple Google search, when you're reaching out to people, they're gonna be possibly offended that you didn't even Google them prior to asking them to take time. And the last point I have on that is that Networking is more than just checking off a list of people that you want to talk to. You have to maintain those relationships. And I feel like law school doesn't teach you how to do that. Um, they don't tell you about that. They're just like, reach out to alum, reach out to this person. But those relationships need watering and they need nurturing and you kind of have to massage them. So you don't want to be the one hit wonder where you 
reach out to someone, you have a great conversation, a great lunch, whatever it is, and then they never hear from you again. If you genuinely connected with that person, you should let them know that. If you didn't like them, then, hey, you don't need to call them or email them every day. But if you genuinely connect with them, the only way that you're gonna maintain that relationship is by circling back and following up. Because again, you're probably in the position where you would be reaching out to them. So until the playing field is a little bit leveled, then make sure you're continuing to express that interest to maintain the relationship. Um, I will add to what I think both of you said it beautifully in terms of how to network. And I will agree that uh, school, the schools say network, network, but they don't really tell you how to do it successfully. So I agree with everything you said. I'm at a point now when people are coming to me and asking me, um, to network with them and just kind of develop that relationship. And um, what I say to young folks that are just coming out of there is exactly what Yanni said, have clarity in your purpose. Why are you networking? And so that you can target the associations or the events that you wanna network in, if for lack of a better word. Um, also, I want to say to people, social media is a great way to network. I've, I've met a lot of great people just on LinkedIn. I per, I'm, I'm not bashful about saying this. I peruse LinkedIn. I look for um, the background of people that I want to be like, and I take a genuine interest in those people. I follow them. I get to know them through their events or when they're invited to be a panelist somewhere and um and then i reach out because by then i've known them so i take the time to study the person and then reach out first um and then reach out second so i want to support everything you said in terms of have the clarity make sure you know what you're doing when you're networking target those network events that are gonna be beneficial to you so that you're not just busy going through a lot of events and yes, people have seen you, but they don't really know what you're about. You're just everywhere. Um, so be specific and be focused in your um, search for the proper networking event. Naz, I don't know if you wanna add anything. Thanks. I was just gonna add that, you know, one good, one other benefit of you know having done your research on who you're reaching out to is that if you are an introvert and you really don't like networking, it gives you something to talk about and something to get that conversation going. Um, and I think that now, especially you know post pandemic, there aren't a lot of in person networking events happening. Um, and so you know you may need to reach out to people individually. And LinkedIn is a great way to, to do that um, rather than uh, some of the other social media, I think platforms, which are more personal and that, you know, um, individuals and attorneys, you know, have more family oriented, um, you know, material on there. But LinkedIn allows you to message someone and you can, you know, set up a call, ask them to meet you um, or set up a Zoom call. Um, I, I've done that with, you know, um, people that I've mentored, people that I am seeking mentorship from because I'm in my eighth year of practice now. So, I mean, I'm still looking to network and expand my, my, my circle and learn and um, seek out, you know, mentors and, and different connections. Um, so having done your, done your research, I think, Kadel, that, that is a great point because it gets the conversation going, especially if you're not a very extroverted, you know, uh, individual. And especially in the, you know, the given the landscape now, where you may not just be able to go to a bar event and walk around and, you know, exchange cards, um, and you may need to do that one to one connection um, on your on your own. And I really want people to leave here with literal tools that they can apply right so one of the things that I always use to start off a networking call. Um, every time I say it, the person on the other call they just uh, they love it right so I start off and I ask them. Are you a bird watcher? You guys can copy this. That's why I'm saying this, by the way. So I, I say, are you, do you watch birds? And they go, no, I don't watch birds. And I said, oh, well, people who watch birds, right? The first bird who sort of made them interested in, in bird watching is known as the bird spark. So my question to you is, what was your bird spark that made you interested in, in the field that you're practicing in? 
And every time I say that, they're so impressed and they're so like, oh, wow, that's a great question. I probably use it on <laughs> Sandra or some of the lawyers here today, but listen, it's gold. And I, and I really, I'm giving away my secrets here um, because I think these are important things that I want everybody here to sort of take note of, right? I'm quirky and sometimes I'm loud and I'm from Brooklyn and I try to inject these things as much as I can into the conversations and let people know, be comfortable with me. You know, this is more than just a networking phone call. I want you to feel like you're talking to a, to a friend or you're talking to somebody that you can have a long relationship with. So thank you. Um, everyone's information was great, right? So let's go to the third tip, right? So we've gone over tip number one, be your authentic self. Tip number two, network to connect, right? And the third tip is seek mentorship with purpose. Now, this one, I think a lot of people sort of struggle with, right? Because there's that line between forcing a mentor, um, forcing that mentorship relationship, and then just sort of having someone in, in midair or, or it being authentic. And I'm sort of, I think it can go either way. I've had great mentors who, um, was assigned to me that have actually evolved into somebody that has been my advocate and somebody who has given me work and somebody that has been, you know, my, my main cheerleader. But I've also had those mentors where we start off as strangers or it's not as formal and it sort of blossomed into that very advocate, you know, cheerleader relationship. So I'm, I think you can go either way with this, but as I stated on the network to connect, your mentor should be important. And whether you're a new associate or some associate, realize that you have worth, you are worth something. And if you're with a mentor that you're not necessarily getting along with, or you don't think you're getting what you need out of that relationship, it's okay to find other ones. And it's also okay to have different mentors for different things. Right? You can have a mentor for emotional support. You can have a mentor for specific information on how to do copyright work or how to learn how to be a great communicator or how to learn how to be a great public speaker, right? It's definitely okay to have several mentors that cater to different to several of your needs. Um, I can jump in and um, throughout law school, I've still struggled to wrap my head around who's really my mentor and who's not. So what I would say is that when you're going into your summer associate position or whatever it is, know that not everybody is going to be a mentor to you. Um, some people are going to be advocates and they might not want to invest because a mentor-mentee relationship is an investment. And it's a lot for a mentor to have a mentee and you know it may be a lot for a mentee to have a mentor and that's a relationship that needs maintenance so looking at it that way you know that not everyone that you look up to and that you would like to be your mentor has time to invest in that relationship but it's okay to have advocates in your practice group and on that point it took me a while to realize this, but your advocates or your mentors don't need to look like you. I constantly sought out mentor mentee relationships with, you know, black women and women that look like me because I know that, well, if these women did it, then I can do it. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but don't be closed minded in the sense where you don't seek out other forms of mentorship or advocacy in people that don't look like you because your biggest advocates at a firm can be you know, the person sitting at the table, not the person that looks like you. So I think it's important to know that when you're seeking mentor-mentee relationships, um, know the distinction between having someone that supports you and that they'll recommend your name for something, but that person is not necessarily your mentor. Because if you don't know the distinction, you may be seeking more out of the relationship than the person is willing to give. So... Yeah, those are excellent points. Um, you know, I don't know if we're gonna talk about it, but there's also, you guys talked about mentoring and, and mentors so well that what I wanted to talk about is sponsors and because there's a little bit of a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. And a mentor is the person that you talk to when you have a need, right? When you wanna bounce ideas off or when you go to, um, 
to try to figure things out. And a sponsor is the person that talks about you as opposed to to you. And what I mean by that is that they open doors for you. They seek, they know you so well that they've transcended the mentor-mentee relationship and they look out for you. And I totally agree with you, Cadell, in that my mentor, um, even from when I was in law school, I was in Boston and um, I was assigned a mentor and it was an older white man. And at first I was like, what do I have in common with this man? And he really took a liking to me. I was green. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but this man actually helped me get my clerkship. Um, also helped me down the road in figuring out, okay, do I want to do the big law or do I want to go in um, government? I ended up going in government because he and I spoke and we knew that this was not, I didn't want to do big law. So he used his connections. He talked about me. He spoke on my behalf. And that to me is a sponsor. And so please, as you start your career, um, just look out for the difference. There's going to be those mentors and I have excellent mentors, people that I can pick up the phone and talk to and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. And we talk about that one moment, that one thing. And then I have sponsors that have actually helped me throughout my whole career. I have not had one job where it wasn't due to a sponsor who said, Sandra would be great for that opportunity, um, even when I didn't even know about the opportunity. So it's important for you to understand that everything you do, your work being your authentic self, um, just networking, you're always branding yourself. And then when that opportunity comes up, either a mentor or most likely a sponsor will um, open that door for you. Naz? Yeah, and just to add, I mean, you know, you can go through whether it's your law school or your firm, um, you know, or an organization like Gall um, to get an, a mentor assigned to you, right? If you don't know where, where to start, um, you can reach out to other partners and senior members of your firm. If you are at a firm or if you're at like the DA's office or like the PD's office, you know, just seek out a, um, a, a more seasoned attorney. Or, you know, in, in, in my case, I, I just started up conversations sitting in like the courtroom with individuals and I've asked them, okay, well, you know, um, that this was a really interesting, you know, topic, or we'd be talking about a motion that we just heard, you know, do you want to grab some coffee and continue this, this conversation? And that has then led to a, a, a type of relationship where I can, I know that that's one person that I can bounce off legal ideas. And so like you were saying earlier, that, you know, you have different people that you go for different needs and that's okay. And if that, you know, and if you have one individual that you do go out for coffee or you do, you know, have a couple of conversations, it's like a relate, it's any relationship, right? If it's not serving you, it's okay to walk away. Um, but just do it in a, in a very professional manner. Um, don't just, you know, ghost them and, and stop her returning calls and stop returning emails and, you know, skip out on, on an appointment, um, you know, to maintain that relationship, because as big as the, the legal community is, it's also very small. Um, and you will see that, uh, that individual in some capacity down, down the road. Um, so, uh, you know, you can reach out to different organizations and be assigned a, a mentor if you don't know where, where to start, um, or reach out to someone one-on-one -on -one and strike up that, that conversation. And I love that, that, you know, um, conversation starter about being a bird watcher because you had me and I was like, what? Where's this going? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah that was very creative. It was <laughs> it's the bird spark. <laughs> yeah. It's every time I say that, right? It's just quirky, just sort of creative ways to, to do the most without doing the most, right? You don't hop on a call and just start doing backflips, but you can certainly inject your personality in different avenues, right? And since we're sort of on the conversation topic of communication, I just want to make clear communication within the law world is so different from communication outside of this law world, right? Whereas if you email somebody, uh, maybe like a boyfriend or somebody that you're interested in and they don't email you back, leave just, you know, leave that as is and then just sort of pack your load and go away. But in the law firm world, if you email a partner 
or you email another lawyer and they don't respond, email them again. And if they don't respond to that, uh, this is me, I'm gonna email you again. And if you don't respond to that and I really wanna speak with you, then I'm gonna reach out to my mentor to say, hey, please email this person and let them know that I've been trying to reach them and um, I deserve to be spoken to because I'm amazing. You know, like you need to sort of have that confidence in yourself. And of course, we're gonna talk about confidence but you need to have that confidence to know that you're worth being spoken to. And, you know, the lawyer and the partner, they may be busy, but certainly keep trying, keep trying. You know, that has always worked for me. I have never have had an instance where I've had to email somebody more than twice and not gotten a response. And I've emailed pretty much everybody in my law firm. So there's that. Do you guys want to comment on that? I definitely agree with that. Cause I'll go ahead. Oh, I, yeah, I agree with Yenny as well. And sometimes, especially in Zoom world, it may take a little more initiative on your part. So if you're trying to get a meeting with someone or you're trying to get a phone call, you might just have to forward them like a calendar invitation and say, hey, respectfully, of course, I put this meeting on your calendar and I was hoping that we can connect for five minutes um, next Tuesday. I noticed that you had availability. Depending on the culture of the place you're working, if people do that, then I would go for it. If people don't do that, then maybe that might seem too aggressive, but I would do it. And I would just say it, it takes away a lot of the back and forth between, you know, trying to say, I called you or I emailed you, no response, what do we do now? Send that calendar invite. And if the time doesn't work for them or the day, they can edit it, but now you skip five steps of the process and you have an answer sooner. So, yeah. And that's exactly what I was gonna follow up with, especially given, you know, the culture now you know, if you send them a Zoom invite, I think more people are um, willing to accept. And so now they even know, okay, well, I don't have to go anywhere. And this is, you know, this is individuals, especially if they're outside of your firm. And I mean, a lot of the firms are, are working remotely. And so they may not even be in the office. So they're at home or they're sitting somewhere else. Maybe they're in Florida working out, uh, you know, uh, working remotely from, from, from there. So I think it kind of takes that pressure off um, where, you know, I think Kadel, you're right about, about that scheduling. So if you just go ahead and put it on their calendar, um, you know, they have the control to, you know, edit, um, and, and change that to a later time. But then if that's available, then all they have to do is just accept. And it's very easy for them, um, to do that and, you know, move forward. All right. So now we are on our fourth tip, which is to take ownership of your work product. I think especially as a summer associate, this is key. Um, well, everything we've discussed is key, but this is like a huge key, right? Um, it's very important to make sure everything that you send is quality. Um, it's very important to make sure at least maybe you had another set of eyes, look at it, proofread it. Um, but I think the most important takeaway that I've had as a summer associate is to over communicate. This is another gem that I'm gonna drop on, on you lovely audience members today. Whenever I get a project, I don't care if they're telling me to proofread something that's gonna take me two seconds. I always make sure I ask these questions. First, I say, what is the client matter number? I think once you guys start working, you will know what a client matter number, that's essentially, who should I build to? Who should I build this project to? Secondly, how much time should I spend on this? How much time am I expected to spend on this? Thirdly, when do you need it by? Fourth question, who should serve as my point of contact when I have questions? And the fifth question, what form would you like the final product to be in? I sometimes had, a, had a, another document where I would just copy and paste because I had so many projects that I would just copy and paste these questions into the email and they would be like, love these questions, great, doom, 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 back to it. Because what you don't want to happen is you're spending four hours on a project that really should have been completed in 15 minutes. Because now that means they have four hours that they can't build to the client and they really just wasted time, right? And it lets you sort of take control and let the person that, the partner or the associate that you're working with know that you know what you're doing, right? These are the little things that you can do to sort of build that confidence, not only in yourself, but in the worker, right? Um, I feel like everybody, after everybody finishes sort of inputting, I'm gonna go over these questions again, because I think everybody here needs to leave with those questions written down.
Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, knowing exactly what you're supposed to be working towards and what the end result is supposed to be, um, you know, that not only goes when you're talking to your apartment partner and receiving projects, but if you are in a smaller setting and you're talking to the client directly, you know exactly what, what they want. Um, why are you here? What is the, what is the legal issue? And, you know, what is the turnaround time and what exactly do I need to get done? Um, that I think saves you also, you know, time and effort because you may be in a, in a situation where there are lots of projects coming your way. And, and at some point you're going to start to feel overwhelmed. And if you are not managing your time, um, the, in the most efficient manner, then, you know, you're going to get burnt out. Right. And that, that, that kind of carries over, you know, you need to establish those practices early on as an attorney, um, as to managing expectations, managing your, 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 your time, um, and making sure that you're, you know, that you're allocating enough time and, and energy to the right places, uh, because as time goes on, you're going to have more and more things kind of built up on your, on your plate and, you know, you need to pace yourself. It's always a marathon. Um, always. And I'll add this, I know in the corporate world, one of the things that they look for as well is how well you handle pressure. So um, the work product matters because that's part of your brand. They wanna see not only how can you work under normal circumstances, but also if you have a last minute project and I'm sure in the, I know when I was a law clerk, we always had to work sometimes and get, um, uh, decision drafted for the judge by the next morning because there's a short turnaround and it's the same thing in the in the corporate world they'll they'll you know we have something happening we need to have a quick decision you have to re research it and be able to provide guidance and in the corporate world you're providing guidance to internal clients so we don't necessarily deal with outside uh, clients because you're dealing with operations, you're dealing with someone who's on the same team as you, but they're looking to, to you for guidance. Um, and so you're, having ownership in your work product is very important because that's your brand at the end of the day. That's the, the, the quality of the work that you deliver day in and day out becomes who you are. That's what people talk about when you're not in the room. And um, so everything that Naz and Yeni said, I totally support because um, especially at the beginning of your career, you wanna make sure that that branding is something that you can live with for the rest of your career. Cause as Naz said earlier, though the legal world is small. I've run into a lot of people that I, started practicing with and I started in Massachusetts believe it or not and I have several of the attorneys that I went to law school with that I practice with in Massachusetts that are now in Georgia so who would have thunk it but there here we are so <laughs> <laughs> so you just want to make sure your work product as your brand speaks for yourself um, all the time Cadell well, yeah, I just wanted to elaborate on a point that Yenny brought up and I think one of her five points, and that was the one about format. So this happened to me my 1L summer, if you guys are going into summer associate positions, um, but I was assigned something and after getting out of 1L year, you do a formal brief, you do all this formal legal writing, the partner wanted an answer to a research question and I wrote like a five page memo. And yeah. that was not what he wanted. He would have been right. fine with a paragraph in an email telling him the answer. So you always need to know, how do you want me, how do you want to receive this information? Do you need a five page memo? Or do you just need two words, the answer is this? Or do you want the cases highlighted? So I think knowing that is going to improve communication between you and whoever's assigning you the work. And the other, the other point that I had was that Assuming, you know, if you guys are working in person this summer or whenever you do start working in person and you're walking around an office, um, make sure that you always carry a notepad and a pen whenever you go into someone else's office because you don't know who's going to think of an assignment on a whim and you always want to be ready to write, to take notes, whatever the case is. So when you're walking around, just be ready that someone might drag you into an office and say, hey, can you help me with this? So that's all I have. And when, and when sort of discussing the work product right i want everybody to remember as well um just say yes 
I, I don't like it to be, obviously that's not absolute because if you're at your, oh, and I see Miriam has a question um, with her hand up, but if you're filled to your head with work and, we, and this is one of the questions in the poll, I think there's a way to say yet to say no politely, right? And we will definitely touch on that where you can say, mm, I don't really have time for it this week, but what about next week or the week after, right? Um, so explore, explore, explore. I never thought that I would ever be interested in insurance litigation, but it ended up being one of the things that I actually like. <laughs> Miss Odemosa, please call me Yenny, please, please. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Um, but yes, yes, yes. And I also wanted to just squeeze in when you're communicating another thing that you're going to do. And again, this lets the person you're working with know that you, you have an idea what you're doing, even if you don't. A day after you get the project, hey, this is what I have so far. Just, just wanted to give you an update. This is what I have so far. Let me know if I'm doing something wrong. The next day, this is what I have so far. So this also lets them know what they're, that you know instills a little bit of confidence in yourself, but it also provides, admittingly so, a little bit of a cover, right? So where if they say this was terrible, I did not ask of this. You can say, well, wait a minute now, I sent you three emails with everything that I've been working on so far. So you know these are strategic moves that I'm putting in, and I feel like the lawyers are are, are grinning at me, but <laughs> these are strategic things that I'm putting in that I think will really really guide you and, and showed you to be a great summer or attorney you know, that, those are excellent point and Miriam I'll let you speak but that is so mm -hmm. important what you said because it's it's not only just CYA covering your butt but also making sure that you're on the same track um as the that you are aligned with what was asked of you how you know how frustrating could it be that you work and, and spent hours on something and then you turn it in and it's not what they were looking for that would just be I mean it's disappointing for you it's disappointing for the person that asked you to work on the project so I totally love that little um piece of wisdom you just shared uh, Miriam I don't know if you can unmute yourself so you can speak but go ahead and ask your question Yes, yes, I can. First, I'd like to say thank you guys so much for this talk. I've learned a lot even in the past, you know, 15, 20 minutes, especially as someone who, um, you know, has a little bit of uh, legal work lined up this summer. Um, I did want to ask about the contrast that you guys have experienced personally in your careers um, from law school writing, like, you know, traditional legal writing to like workplace writing. Um, I have uh, taken like legal research and writing and civil procedure and written memos and papers, which I personally, my own writing style is very concise and to the point. So legal writing thus far to me has seemed pretty repetitive and redundant. And I was expressing that concern to a friend of mine who works at an IP law firm. And he was saying that his boss wants, never wants to see a memo ever. He just wants, you know, three line email that says issue rule, what do we need to do about it? Um, so I just was wondering in, in y'all's professional lives, uh, is it more informal, is it more formal? Like, is it more direct? Is it more um, like legally verbose, that kind of stuff? Um, Miriam, are you doing IP? Are you gonna be joining a, a firm doing IP if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, I'm currently uh, working at a family law firm and that is my interest. But right now it just so happens that the people who I know who are working in a practice and not in law school are mostly IP type attorneys or like I should say type uh, clerks. Um, and I'm sure the other panelists will have um, some great thoughts on this too. But, but let me just say, I know maybe because I'm biased towards IP, I think we're just an interesting bunch. Uh, we don't like the boring chit chat. We like to get straight to it. Every time I was given a project, my emails were bullet points. This is what the answer is. Like all of this IRAC and ILARC, yes, rarely will they ask for a full-fledged memo, maybe more so if you're doing litigation. But as in terms of like a summer associate priority project or just in general, it's safe to assume straight to the point. If they ask you if the dog was wet according to Alabama law, just say that this is the law, yes, the dog was wet. If they want more information, they'll ask you for more information, you know? So definitely, I, I hate to say, forget everything you've learned in law school, um, because you need to know like the citations and general ILARC format, but just keep as a rule of thumb, the more concise, they love it, they love it. 
Yeah, agreed. I think moving forward, just as a summer associate, you want to put your bottom line at the, the front of the email because whoever is looking at the email, they probably don't have that much time. They want to skim it in two seconds and get the answer that they need. So not saying you can't send an attachment with the formal you know, writing product, but in that email, in the body, once they open it, they need to see their answer and maybe three or four bullets, underlines, letting them know what's important. So I think regardless of the type of field that you're practicing, when someone asks you for an assignment, they want the bottom line up front, so. Very true. And I think that, you know, when you're talking about the, the bottom line, it's also bottom dollar. So they want to spend as little time as possible on it and they want the answer right away. And that's, you know, for inter-office communication. And so if you are as a, you know, new attorney and this is your job and you are, you know, as opposed to like a law clerk where they're maybe giving you a research assignment. And so that internship now develops into um, you are a new attorney and now you have to draft a motion and go into civil litigation and argue the brief or you're handed like an appellate case, you know, in a different type of in, a, in like a civil firm or a criminal firm or whatever it may be. Well, obviously that's going to be more, you know, um, expansive. It's you're going to go more, more in depth and it's not just going to be, you know, boom, boom, boom is, is the bullet point. So inter-office communication, it can be very, it can be very concise. And I think that that's what everyone is looking for because you just want the answer. You want to move on. You want to spend very little time on it. And if you're actually drafting formal motions, briefs, um, you know, and actually litigating and going that that's going to go into the file, it's going to be filed with the court, then that's going to be more formal. And I agree with everything you just said, because um, I know for me, when my colleagues, I support the C-suite and they already want to do what they want to do anyway. So by the time they're checking in with you, they just really want you to rubber stamp what they want to do. So a one word answer in my situation is like the quickest way to say, yes, you can or no, you can't. No, no, you can't. Um, but honestly, one thing that you said, and I think Miriam said that's a good point, is uh, time is money. So the more, the longer they have to sit there and read and go through this jargon and figure it out, they're already frustrated. So uh, as Cadell and Yanni said, just let your bottom line be your top answer. And then the, I, I haven't met anybody who's in our profession who's shy about asking for more detail. If they want more, more detail, trust yeah. and believe, they will come back and say, hey, can you elaborate on this for me? Because I want more. But uh, I agree with everything. And um, Juan, I, I see your hand. Uh, and then let me, uh, we will definitely give you opportunity to, to speak. Let me just make this quick comment. There's also a dark side to attorney work and summer social work that I wanted to really speak on because I want this to be authentic and genuine, right? There are going to be times where there may be a partner who doesn't like women or doesn't like you because of the color of your skin or there's an issue and you'll get a review that's a little too personal and that's a little bit rude and that's just just incorrect, right? I hate your work. You did it. Dude. It's ridiculous, right? I and, and again, people may disagree with me it's cool. I personally feel like you're, you're okay. It's okay to defend yourself at times, right? Especially when you know something on the line is like an offer, um, especially in COVID time, when the evaluations come out in the end and they ask you, hey, I saw this negative evaluation, what happened? I think it's okay to say, hey, um, I communicated this to the lawyer and I don't know if he didn't get my emails or if he, I don't, I don't know what happened there, but I did my part. I don't know. Right, I definitely had to get counseling and training on how to be polite in this <laughs> realm. Um, like Ms. Sanja said, I need to work on learning how to hide my poker face, but um, I think it definitely is a learned skill, but I just want everybody here to remember that you're worth something, right? I hate the term baby lawyer. No, you're great. You're, if you're a lawyer, you're a lawyer, period, right? Um, and yes, you will have to earn certain things, but um, I definitely think respect is, is um, something that should be inherent in, in everybody, regardless of the amount of years you've been practicing. And Juan, did you have something that you wanted to say? I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. First of all, I just want to say, you know, thank you to all the panelists for taking time out to have this session. Um, I had a different question, but what uh, Yenny just said kind of made me think of a, what I think might be a better question that I think just kind of uh, touches more on what this panel is about. Uh, say you do kind of get like this negative feedback 
and you know you kind of feel like it's coming out of nowhere like how do you best protect yourself against that i've heard before things like you know email document everything um and i guess my only worry with that is like does it seem weird to like every conversation to follow it up with an email and be like oh just per our last conversation like does it make you look like kind of like someone who doesn't trust what other people are telling you and you always have to be like you're following it up with an email you know what i mean yeah, I I definitely get where you're coming from, Juan. And some advice that I actually received this week, like yesterday, um, that might help combat these situations because we're going to face them once we start practicing. But you can start keeping a kudos folder. So every email, and it sounds kind of childish, but every email or everything you get where someone says, oh, great job on this, Juan, great job on this, Yeni, or you really did this, just drag it in the folder, drag it in the folder. And it sounds crazy, but you know it does help you build your file and build a case and just in case someone wants to try you and say you messed up on this or you haven't been doing what you need to do at evaluation time so it's good to have that now the flip side of that is that you also want to do the same thing for other people so you know sending them a kudos and cc'ing their boss or whatever the case is will also help to do the same thing for others. But I would keep that kudos folder and I didn't think of it before until a professor told me yesterday, but going into practice, that's something I'm gonna do where I just make sure I have it to the side, not saying I'm gonna need it, but I know that I'm covering all my bases. And I'm 24 years in, I still do what you just said. It was told to me a very um, early in my career, keep a kudos file. And I do so. I mean, if I get any um, feedback that's positive, I keep it in the file so that I can later refer to it. And one, just to address what you say, there's nothing wrong with, I always say to people, expect an email form from me because number one, I don't know if you can tell, but I do have an accent. So I, I'm very open about my accent. I said, look, English is my third language. So I'm gonna send you an email to confirm what I thought I, walked, I, I heard. And so that if there's no miscommunication about what it is that I'm gonna work on. So I send that email, I said, just to confirm our conversation, and my team now, I have a whole team that reports to me, they're like, you're so anal. I record and document everything. I don't care what it is, I will document and send an email to, to confirm. Um, so I would say to you, there's nothing wrong with keeping that kudos file. There's nothing wrong with sending an email. I think it's actually very well, very pervasive in our world. People do it all the time. And then the third thing I would say to you is if you were ever in a situation where you need to defend your work or something that you, whatever it is, a feedback and evaluation, just be factual. I know it's hard to keep the emotions out. I remember my first year as an attorney, I've always done well in school. And I, my first year, they're giving me this feedback that I'm like, where's this coming from? And I couldn't hide my emotions, but I learned it's better to just keep it factual, address the key salient parts, and then just keep moving and um, document where you don't agree. But that's a very good question. And for the sake of time, I definitely want to move to the fifth tip, right? Thank you guys for your input. It was great advice. Um, and that is be confident. I, I, I can't stress this enough. You need to walk into the building like you know what you're doing, OK? Now, if that means you make sure your hair is on point every day, then that's fine. If that means you make sure your outfit is nice, and, and bye, Kelsey, thank you for joining us. Um, if that means that you have your earrings on, your favorite good luck earrings on, do that. But you need to make sure that you, you're confident because I hate to say it, but the law world is, is adult. It's a very eat or be eaten world, right? Once they smell that raw meat, it's over. Like it, it, you don't wanna allow that avenue for, um, missed opportunities because you didn't not only did you not have confidence in yourself but the people around you were like well if she doesn't or he doesn't have confidence in themselves why, why should i place confidence in them right if there's a new project and you're interested in it even if you have no idea how to do it say listen i'm interested in this and i would like to learn oh i don't have time to teach you well can you point me to a paralegal that i can reach out to or can i sit in on the deposition it's okay if i just listen 
you know, just let them know that, listen, you're here to work and you're here to make a name for yourself. Um, and I think that's something that I always keep in mind. I always tell myself, I'm here not only to work, but I'm here to make a name for myself. It's either go big or go home, you know? And yeah, that is exactly right. It's like, you know, you have to, you are going to, you are there to show what you know, because you do have that knowledge. I mean, you got here for, you know, for a reason, um, you know, so you have to trust yourself that everything that you have worked um, on and everything that you have done is what brought you here and that you do have the knowledge to go further. Yes, there is always more to learn. You should never be in that, in that boat that, oh, I know everything and I shouldn't, you know, that I don't have anything else to, to learn. Um, but rely on what you know, um, be prepared and be open-minded. Like you said, you know, if you want to learn a different area, if there is a case that is interesting to you, just ask, can I come to court with you? Can I listen to this? Can I sit on that, on that, uh, on that deposition? Can I talk to the, you know, to the lead attorney or the other associates that are on like the team and learn more, more about it? Um, you know, a lot of it, especially when you get to get to the courtroom and you're against opposing counsel, um, if they know that you are nervous, there are many attorneys that will, that will definitely play on that and they will become more aggressive than they already are. So you have to find that within yourself to, okay, well, this is how I'm going to center myself when I'm in court or when I'm in the, when I'm in the boardroom or wherever you are, and this is how I'm going to present myself. If you need to practice, then practice. Um, in front of the mirror, um, this is how my face is gonna look like. This is how my hand movements are, because I, I talk with my hands. But over time, I have learned, okay, well, this is where I'm going to center myself. And this is where my hands are going to be. This is what my face is going to look like. These are the pauses that I'm going to make. Um, and because I've done a lot of trial work and, and when you're talking to a jury, when you're talking to a judge, you need to pace yourself. And I think as a, as a younger attorney, and I feel that, you know, as, as, a, as a female, um, you know, you need to focus on your, um, how you project and your voice. Um, and, you know, you need to show and your confidence definitely carries through your voice and, you know, your, your body language. So if you need to take that time, um, you know, and, and spend some time with yourself in front of a mirror, so you know exactly how you look like and, you know, what your, what your hands are doing and what your body is doing, um, you know, body language also conveys, you know, how confident you're feeling or how, how you just look, because, you know, you may not feel it, but as long as you look it, that's all that matters. <laughs> and I think some practical things, because again, I'm all for the, I want you guys to leave with practical things, right? Um, there was a study that showed when you actually literally open up your body, right, you're perceived as more powerful, right? You're, per you're also perceived as more comfortable. So I guess that's why when people cross the finish line, they, they raise their hands like, oh, well, you know, we sort of adapt through evolution. We've learned these from animals and, and sort of grown into just uh, adopting it into our human society. But this is not a science lesson, right? Um, these are practical things, right? When you're on a Zoom call, you can sit like this and sort of open yourself up a little bit and, and perch yourself up a little bit and, and say, oh, okay, you don't have to be the loudest. If being loud is not you, that's completely fine. If being bolstery and, and sort of flamboyant is not you, that's fine. There are other ways to inject confidence, right? Um, another way, when you shake somebody's hand, grip it. Mm-hmm. Grip, grip that hand. When you shake the hand, we don't need meek handshakes, okay? This is meek. Grip it. And these are, these are signs, these are social cues, heuristics that us human beings rely on because as we all know, our brains are entirely too small. Like we don't, we can't rationalize and we can't sort of process every piece of information. So as human beings, we rely on heuristics, right? This is science. One of the heuristics that we rely on is handshake, impression. When you meet someone for the first time, it takes them five seconds to have an impression on you. This is the average, like this is science, right? So what we want to do is sort of work with what we know to get what we want. A third thing, and, and the final thing for the sake of time, I know some people are running or, you know, probably have other places to be, but when someone asks you, um, hi, how are you? You say, I'm fine. Make sure you ask them back. This applies to interviews, meetings, 
people don't realize a lot of people don't ask oh I'm, I'm fine thank you and how are you today that's not common um and I think these are little things to do that sort of inject that confidence where they're like oh oh okay all right so clearly we're, I'm not the one that's going to lead this conversation entirely, right? It lets them know that, okay, I'm actually speaking to an actual human being, right? Um, so again, these are some practical things. And I do have a poster. Yes, thank you, um, Nas, um, that I will send out to each of you, um, the million people who shut up. I'm so grateful. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. But I will send out this flyer because I think it's important sort of to-do list that you can just look at, glance at, and hit right on top of the head. We had a poll that we sent out, and please feel free to leave for the sake of time. Um, I understand I don't want to keep everybody here, but I just wanted to just get anybody's advice, right? And this is open to the floor. We have a situation where you're a new partner at a firm, you're a new associate at a firm, and a partner has given you five projects to work on. Another partner who you really want to work on the project with says, hey, I have this deal with this once in a lifetime, you know, company and I want you on it, but you know, for a fact, you cannot handle it. You know, for a fact that there's no way you can take on this project and produce good work. What should you do? Um, and please, if, if anyone that's a panelist or audience, um, if you guys could just sort of unmute yourselves and just chime in, this is definitely more of an interaction, interactive aspect of the panel. I, I really want to know, what should you guys do? Should you take on the project or should you not? So it was interesting. We kind of, um, Cadell, you, you can you can start. Uh, uh, we had started discussing this uh, before we uh, started the. Um, oh no no no! You can finish finish your thought. I don't want to interrupt you. And so and it was it was just interesting because I feel like you know as a as a practicing attorney, my answer. I mean, I knew that I'm like okay, well, I really shouldn't. But in the past, I have, and I probably would, um, you know, continue, you know, if placed in that situation again, probably take that, you know, project on because when you're younger, you want to, as you said, you want, you're there to make a name for yourself, and you feel um, that external and internal pressure, right, to take the work on to prove that you can do it. Um, but you know, and and I think that in my experience. Um, there were other attorneys who kind of saw and stepped in and said, well, you know, do you really want to take this on? Or how about you just kind of sit second chair on this one? And, and then I was like, okay, whew, okay, yeah, I can sit second chair. I would much rather appreciate that because I have, you know, 10 other things that I have, I have to focus on and deadlines to meet. Um, but, you know, you have to be um, kind of that um, that triage person for yourself. No one else is going to step in and do it for you. And it's okay to say, no, I, you know, at this time, I cannot be the lead person on this project. Um, can someone else take lead? And I'm, I'm happy to assist so that way I can continue to learn and grow. Or thank you for thinking of me. But at this time, I, I would really like to, you know, put my entire effort and energy in what I have and do my best work as opposed to be spread thin. And I think people will understand and people do understand that because others have been in that situation too. Um, and you know, you're know, you in a point where you want to produce your best work. And if you keep on just taking on and taking on, um, then you're not gonna produce your best work. And so it's actually going to backfire, right? Um, that you're, you know, you're doing kind of coasting on everything as opposed to picking that one thing and really doing well on it. Yeah, I'll just add that no one is going to manage your schedule for you. You have to be in charge of your own calendar. You have to know what you can handle and know when, okay, I'm spreading myself way too thin. Um, on the flip side of that, I've kind of had a similar situation happen to me. So I'll take it from the perspective of a summer associate. Um, from that perspective, sometimes when, you know, you're assigned multiple assignments, the partners will talk. And so if you feel that you have a major conflict as a summer associate where, you know, you're being supervised by maybe an attorney manager, um, sometimes the partners will work that conflict out too. They will say, well, I really need her on this. So your deadline is not really a deadline. It's just something that you want, but I have this that's due to the court tomorrow. And that's not always going to be the case, but in a situation like that, 
they can know what takes priority. Now, in a situation where they don't know your life and they don't know what you have on your plate, you have to be the one to say, no, I, I mean, I wanna be able to produce amazing work on this, so I can't take that. And not everyone is gonna like when you say no, but I think something I've had to work on and that I'm still working on is saying no or saying yes, but I can do it next week. My schedule for this week is full. There's nothing else I could take on. So I think just knowing how to maneuver your schedule and knowing how to talk to people will help with that. Definitely, I would vote. And again, I want everybody to be able to at least answer just honestly, right? Because the poll was sent out prior to the registration, prior to the Zoom and actually 66% of people said that they wouldn't take it. Um, I, I wouldn't take the project, I'm sorry, um, Nas. I, just, I, I would personally would not take, if I know for a fact, I'm not going to be able to produce good work product, but I would never say, no, I cannot take this. I would always do what Cadell just suggested and say, yeah, yeah, sure. Is it okay if I have it to you by next Friday? Because this, this, I'm work and I will literally list out the project so they know I'm not, I'm not horsing around here. This is exactly what I have going on. Sometimes if I'm feeling, if I know they're probably going to be a bit suspicious or, or not as trusting. I'll list out the partners as well that I'm working on other projects with just so they have an idea of, you know, where I am. But this has happened to me several times over the summer. Um, and this is why I created this sort of scenario, because it is very common for you to have four, five, three huge projects and for someone else to sort of just give you another one on top of your head. But you need to learn how to say no by saying yes, in a way. And I agree with everything you just said, because um, I'm more like Nas, I probably think, I think now I look at you young lawyers and I'm like, if I had half the confidence that you guys have today, I probably would have said no by saying yes, but really just giving myself the time. When I came out, we did not have that level of mentorship. We did not have that transparency and the ability to connect as much. And I've seen it progress over the years. And it's beautiful to see, even though they say, you know, um, there's a report that came out, I believe either last year or earlier this year that only 5% uh, of all attorneys are minorities and 2% are women, minor, black women. And it's, um, it's amazing to see how the younger attorneys are coming out with this level of confidence and the ability to speak back. And I think it's a factor of not only that there's more mentors and people are relating more to each other, but also the younger generation is just more bold. And so to be able to see that, I think um, our profession is in good hands <laughs> um, and it's, it's gonna move forward. So I just echo everything you say. It's, it's just how you say no primarily and how you manage that interaction so that you are showing them that you're not shying away from additional work, but that you're fully in control of what it's gonna take out of you to produce the work that they're asking of you. And I'll just link it back and I'm gonna put the put your flyer up if anyone wants to, you know, take note of it or screenshot it, you know, that it always goes back to communication. How you're presenting yourself and how you're communicating, you know, to your partners, to your, you know, other attorneys in like the firm, um, to your clients, it's gonna um it's that's where what it what it is key, how you are communicating, um, whether or not you know you can take that project um, and how you and how you appear. So I'm going to go ahead and, and share this once again. And I don't see any other questions um, in the chat. Uh, and this will be available, um, you know, online and on like the website. So if you want to refer others to, you know, watch this at a later time, and if there are any other questions, you can always send them to gall.communications at gmail.com. Um, and, you know, the, one of us or someone um, on the board would definitely respond. Um, and if there are any concluding remarks before we hop off, um, I would welcome those. Thank you so much, ladies, for this, um, you know, great discussion. I think it was very fruitful. Um, yeah. And 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I want to say thank you, Nas. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Cadell. Um, thank you, Juan Martinez. Thank you, Mariam Akbar. And thank you, Melissa Knott, um, for sticking with us, you know, till the very, very end. But thanks to everyone who came out today. I really, really hope you guys are leaving with practical information. I will be reaching out to everyone via LinkedIn. Um, and like Nas said, the, the uh, link to this web, uh, to this program will be on the GOA website. Do not be a stranger. I'm going to be pretty annoying. So I'm going to reach out to you guys and, and schedule a one-on-one -on -one call. But it was really, really glad. I was glad um, speaking on this panel with everyone. And I look forward to future programs. I think Melissa has a question. She raised her hand. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for the part on uh, confidence and like other ways of uh, showing that you're being confident. Because I think a lot of times, um, we just get caught up or we think you have to be like loud or something like that, but it could, it can merely be in how you present yourself. Um, and I think that's something I'm learning uh, as we, as we go on, cause like there are different personality types and everyone's not always extroverted. So I know for me, I'm, I'm an introvert um, and I usually just expect my work to speak for itself and so when I get opportunities or something that I'm like, here, I do it and then boom. Um, but I, I am learning that confidence is communicated in other aspects as well. So I appreciate you guys for saying that. Definitely, sure. and you know, your work product will, will speak for you, but sometimes that is not enough. Um, yeah. So, you know, you need to be your own advocate and, and it's, it's difficult to do because you know, you don't want to come off as someone who is, you know, just boastful and, and pompous, but yeah. um, when you are doing the work, then, you know, then uh, speak up and make sure that when else, someone else is recognizing it, it goes in that, in that file, you know, mm -hmm. um, those, those kudos uh, are well-deserved and, um, you know, that can be brought up later uh, to benefit you and help you move up. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we're going to call it a night. Thank you. It was a great program. And um, I hope everyone has a good night and a good rest of the week. Thank you for having good me. Night. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.